Welcome everyone to our quarterly webinar. Um, per usual, Adam will provide an overview of glo global asset uh, class returns for uh, the recent quarter and recent past. Uh, he will also touch on uh, the market corrections that we've had of late um, and, and uh, address what happens when stocks reach all-time highs, which of course we recently have. Uh, Andy will give uh, an update on, on size and style uh, in our positioning. Uh, he'll <clears throat> review how stocks are reacting to inflation data as that comes in, and then he'll uh, provide an update on our decisions uh, regarding uh, turning our recovery stock selection model uh, back off. Um, but before I pass the the uh, the mic, uh, just real quick, the security pass uh, packages just passed supporting both Ukraine and Israel means that we can expect pretty much a status quo in those two wars. Uh, those um, conflicts are factored into current security pricing. Uh, an escalation in either one of those uh, is not factored in, and we can uh, expect a, as a result of that periodic bouts of volatility um, as uh, concerns and fears of a widening conflict occur. Uh, this is particularly uh, appropriate in the Middle East where there can be uh, oil uh, supply disruptions. Um, so we, we went through a uh, marketing exercise and came up with a, a company motto, which is performance matters, uh, sort of surprising, uh, but I know this uh, just you know, interacting with, with peers in, in our business. This is not a philosophy shared by a majority of uh, investment firms, but it's certainly one that is central to, to who we are. This, of course, started with Jack Burney. Uh, everything that he did for all the years that he was with us was all uh, uh, supporting that, um, that philosophy. Um, as we've expanded beyond it, uh, equity investment management into financial planning and now into tax planning. And, and for Adam, I put my shirt on for him, my, my Bernie tax uh, advisor shirt. Um, you know, that philosophy has uh, carried over into uh, everything that we do. Um, and you can see that with this list of, of credentials. I don't think there's many firms in our business that could rival um the, the list of credentials that we have. And as you can see, uh, financial planning, CFP has uh, overtaken uh, CFA, which was the standard de designation for most of the company's um, uh, history as investment management. But you can see that we've got a nice balance now with uh, very impressively credentialed people uh, on the planning side and on the tax side. Uh, so just understand that uh, all of this is is there to support you and, and your objectives. So with that, Adam, I'll pass the baton. All right, thanks, Lol. And uh, just looking at markets globally across the quarter, uh, a lot of green across the board again. Uh, it's it's really amazing to watch what we've witnessed the last, uh, let's call it six months, almost a 30% pop in the, uh, the S&P uh, 500 from its you know, low point in the fall up to where it, it was not just only a few uh, weeks ago. And uh, the stories have been markedly different between Q4 of last year and Q1 of this year. At this time, uh, you know, just a, you know, let's call it, you know, a few months ago at one of our last quarterly webinars, a lot of the conversation revolved around the idea that a lot of rate cuts are coming and they're coming soon. So a lot of the rally that happened towards the end of 2023 was driven around the optimism and the idea that the Fed would start cutting rates um, in the in really, you know, by the mid front part of this year, and that there would be six to seven of them by the time the year was over. So you saw risk assets across the board rally hard and strong in the idea that rate cuts were on the horizon, coupling that with a really strong economy at the time and the story and the headlines were all around, hey, this is that soft landing scenario that uh, a lot of us didn't think were possible, uh, was possible the year the year before. And uh, so all the, the headaches and the ups and downs and the volatility we had in 2022 was worth it because we got to this place of almost perfection of dialing in inflation in, in, in light of a strong economy. Fast forward to this quarter, and the idea of rate cuts, uh, as at least six or seven rate cuts, is heavily off the table. Uh, now there's a, a you know really strong chance, and markets are pricing in that we're not going to see any rate cuts in June, and that we might see 
one to two before the end of the year. But in spite of that, we still saw a double digit, uh, you know, really strong quarter for domestic equity. And the primary driver behind that, obviously, is no longer rate cuts. It's still the fact that we've got an incredibly resilient and strong economy across the board. Uh, this is a, an economy that's defied expectations at every single turn, uh, you know, since this whole rate hiking cycle began. It's, uh, you know, it's really debunked a lot of historical trends in terms of what you typically can see in tightening cycles, um, at least in the short run with stock returns. And uh, so uh, investors really in aggregate don't seem to be as concerned about the number of rate cuts that we see this year, so long as the economy is as strong as it is. So uh, we saw that here, you know, in the U.S., even overseas markets had, uh, you know, positive returns for the quarter. And then the one area or pocket that has yet to see any major relief has been the bond market. Um, so those with really heavy allocations in fixed income have really experienced uh, a, a, a sizable drawdown over the last few years as rates have gone up and bond prices have gone down. There was hope that there would be some sort of a, of a relief as rate cuts began uh, through this year, uh, and uh, that's still been a challenge. So for your typical, you know, classic 60-40 stock-to-bond investor, they've really had a tough time uh, the last several years, uh, especially with that 40% allocation to fixed income. So for our clients that are in diversified, balanced models outside of only equities, we've been really excited uh, and proud of the fact that, uh, you know, we while we've had some allocation to fixed income, we've had a really uh, a meaningful amount of exposure in other areas, not fixed income related, uh, that have held up incredibly well through uh, this, you know, really the, the, for the, the bulk of this market cycle. Uh, so on the tune that, uh, you know, we're, we're really focused on how to generate uh, returns for a given level of risk. We really are uh, excited about the fact that we've been able to diversify into these alternative asset classes and uh, do it at a time when the bond market has had a historically bad uh, run. So for those still uh, with heavy bond allocations elsewhere or um, thinking about you know changing from their current portfolio into something more balanced due to a life event or something of that nature, uh, we've got a lot of great ideas and feedback on what that asset allocation should look like outside of your typical, you know, balanced 60-40, 50-50 stock to bond uh, retirement mix. Uh, and so if we kind of zoom out from there and look at the longer term trends, you know, this is the first time in the past couple of quarters where it's just top to bottom, we, you know, green. Uh, so we fought out of this, uh, you know, tough bear market from 2022 so trailing one, five, and 10-year returns for all asset classes are still, um, you know, in the green at this point. And uh, the, the the one, you know, a couple of big differentiating points that we still focus on is, you know, equity returns in the U.S. have been slightly above average over this 10-year runway. International equity returns have been um, well below average. So that's something that, you know, investors are still grappling with, you know, when they look at how do I want to diversify my portfolio? We've got way above average growth in the U.S., but also higher you know, valuations. And, uh, but overseas, we've got slower growth, but stocks are looking a lot cheaper. Um, and so as part of the asset allocation decisions, it's not just stocks versus bonds. It's, hey, within my equity mix, how much international exposure um, should I have and what makes sense? So we've got a lot of opinions on that. Um, uh, but we are noticing some really uh, strong diversification benefits from uh, international equities, especially in the last year, uh, as there's been some divergences. Uh, and so uh, with that, there's two common themes that have popped up the last, uh, let's call it the last you know, six weeks, six to eight weeks, that I wanted to touch on before passing over to Andy. And the one was, hey, we're, uh, we hit this Goldilocks period, this six-month window of really just a straight shot to the top of 30% uh, equity return in a really condensed period of time. The last couple of weeks, we've seen a little more volatility. Uh, what does that mean? You know, are, is this the start of, whenever this happens, regardless of the timing and the magnitude, the question's always, what's happening? What does this mean for the markets and how long is this going to last? 
Um, and so this here is a really good reminder of, uh, in some context around what's happened market-wide uh, since the March 2009 low. So over the last 15 years, how many times has the market dipped uh, from top to bottom by 5% or more? And what was the catalyst for it? And how long did it last? Um, so we just towards the end of last week, last Friday, I think we closed down um, just about 5%, um, a little over 5%. Uh, so we we've got a new addition to the uh, the table here. Uh, but you notice this has happened uh, five plus percent corrections have happened almost thirty times in the last fifteen years. That really lines up with longer term trends and averages. You typically see a couple of five percent drawdowns per year, about one ten percent sell off per year, um, and then a you know more significant bear market of a twenty percent drawdown or more every five years or so. And uh, a lot of times the catalyst for these things will look and feel very different. The themes can be similar. For instance, you see a lot of things on this table that reference geopolitical type events, thing, uh, concerns around what the Fed's doing, what's the government doing, are we or are we not in a recession? So uh, each time it might feel a little bit different. Uh, and uh, you know, the specific circumstances you know, can vary but uh, all in all, it's going to happen and it's going to repeat itself. Uh, and that's the cost of being a long term, uh, you know, equity investor. As we've seen just in the last, you know, five, six years, we've had three uh, really, uh, yeah, three, you know, three and change uh, drawdowns of 20 percent or more. Uh, so I think all in all, this is what's happening now. And the six percent pulled back is, a, is in the context of a really really, really strong, resilient economy. And um, we considered it to be incredibly healthy, especially in light of the fact that we just had a 30% run up in stock. So these are the kinds of pullbacks that you want to see. They're not driven by any um, major, uh, you know, out of left field events or crisis level events that make you think that it might trickle into the broader economy hard and fast. These are just your generic run of the mill pullbacks that we see um, often and, and, and frequently, especially in short windows of time. And the other question we get is, um, and this happens every time the market hits an all-time high and you get the, uh, you know, the CNBC alert or Wall Street Journal alert, you know, F, you know the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ hit an all-time high. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, you know, clients start to ask, you know, is this a good time to put cash to work? Should I be concerned you know, with the market being too expensive because we hit an all-time high. And uh, I I love what this here captures because it looks at not only when the market's hit an all-time high, but when ha what, what has happened after the market hit an all-time high when we haven't made one in a meaningful period of time. Uh, and so what happened la uh, just a couple of months ago is we hit, uh, in January, we hit an all-time high that we hadn't hit in uh a little over two years. So it's been 24 months since we had had an all-time high. And uh, you can see other windows on the left, like uh, start and end dates of, you know, all the way going back to the 1950s up till now, other periods where it had been a year plus since we had an all-time high. How long did we go without reaching an all-time high leading up to it? You could see here uh, in the early 80s, it was 90 months. In 07, it was 86 months. So there's been some some gaps here where uh, investors had to be really patient and wait a while. But after that all time high was reached, how did things look one month, three months, six months, or twelve months later? And uh, without getting into the minutia, you see a lot of green and um, stocks hitting at all time high. There's you know tends to be a catalyst for continued momentum and strength in the market. And across all of these different data points. You know, on average, in ninety three percent of instances, the markets were higher a year a year later. Um, not every single market cycle is the same. There's always things that can happen in the interim that throw things on course. It's not to say that this time is not going to be different. Um, but typically, if you look um, strictly uh, at the data point uh, over the last several decades, um, an all time high is actually not that big scary monster we should be worried about. It's actually an indicator. Um, at least on a forward-looking basis of of, of you know, things uh, translating to more positive uh, momentum. So we got a couple of questions of that in the Q&A about like, hey, 
the market's at a new top, a new all time high. Should I be worried? Is this you know time to be more conservative or take a more um, you know balanced posture in my portfolio? And uh, we'll probably get to more of that in the Q and A. But I think this was a really cool uh, summary and uh, point of hopefully uh, you know affirmation that uh, that's not the case. Yeah, Adam, I think it's a great point. Stocks should be making all time highs. I think a fun game I like to play sometimes is. Guess just in your head what level the S and P 500 was back in 1990, and then go back and look it up to see how close you are. You know the, the just the scale of it is is shocking. Um, real quick before we go on to my section here, I wanted to uh, you know call attention to the fact that we are doing a Q and A session here at the end of this webinar. Some of you submitted questions when you registered for the webinar, so those have been loaded in there already. You don't need to go put those back in. Uh, but if any questions do pop up, feel free to take out your phone and scan this QR code right now. Um, that should take you to the, uh, you know, the the platform that we're using to ask questions. So if you have any questions there, go ahead and enter them. You can enter them anom anonymously if you'd like. Um, if you see a question that's already in there that you do like, you can give it a little upvote and that'll bring it to the top of the queue um, and bring it to our attention to ask. So I just wanted to make that point real quick. Uh, to scan this QR code, you'll have an opportunity to to scan it again once we actually start the Q and A session. So I'm going to start by doing my typical size and style review. We always like to see where returns are coming from, um, and just to refresh everyone with our you know primary U.S. equity strategy. You know the thing that we aim to do here is to lean towards the size and style phase of the market that we expect to outperform moving forward. Uh, there can be long times where growth is in favor over value or small caps over large caps. And we wanna make sure we're getting that positioning right in portfolios. So our current positioning today is leaning uh, substantially into growth. We're at what we consider our max growth bet and also substantially into non-large caps. So I'll call that mid caps and small caps. If you take a look at the market cap of the, of the uh, overall stock market, about 90% of it is in that large sphere. Um, but we're only allocating about 60% of our portfolios there right now. So we're materially underweight that, expecting to see uh, more investment opportunity from the small and mid caps. So I always like to check in on that to see how our positioning has done over the last quarter. And what you can see here from this chart is when we look at that three-month column right in the middle, it's been a strong quarter for growth. Both large growth and mid growth have performed um, you know, in double digits over the course of the whole quarter. They're leading when we look over at a one year timeframe as well. Um, so this positioning of leaning into growth has paid off so far this year. Uh, one area of the market though, that has been a little bit interesting to watch is the small cap space. So when we look over here, we see small growth and small value. And you can see that they've you know, basically lagged the rest of the market over you know, most of the timeframes that we see here. That's a little bit unusual because normally what happens after a big market sell-off is you see small cap stocks, you know, they tend to get beaten down the most during the sell-off. They also bounce back the most uh, during the subsequent recovery. And that just hasn't happened in small caps. Adam mentioned that, um, you know, the S&P 500 is back to previous all-time highs. And that's true in the large cap space and the mid cap space, but small caps are actually still below where they were on January 1st of 2022. So we're waiting for those small caps to still jump forward. And in a few slides, we'll talk about maybe some of the reasons why they haven't done that yet. But I do want to make the point that, you know, while we define small caps as companies that are typically $2 billion and below, uh, mid cap companies that tend to be between two and 8 billion in terms of market cap have actually done well. And especially the mid growth subset of those uh, of that section has done well. So while we are leaning substantially into the non non-large, we do have a big bet right now in this mid growth uh, tile right here that has done very well. So this has been a nice tailwind to a lot of our investment strategies uh, so far this year and a lot of your, your portfolios that we have. Um, you know, so it was a great start to the year. Uh, you know, our, our factor tilts were paying off. One thing I did want to point out, though, is that we have been under a little bit of volatility so far in April. So April 19th is the date here that you saw referenced in some of Adam's slides earlier as well, just because that was the low point, um, you know, for, for the month of April, just the, really the max drawdown date. Um, and an interesting thing here has happened, you know, I'll say anecdotally experiencing this live. 
it felt like growth was really taking it on the chin. And while we do see growth, you know, underperform a little bit over, you know, in the large cap space and the mid cap space, it really is pretty similar to what we're seeing across the board. It's been more of a broad based sell off than maybe I was expecting to see um, when I put this chart together. You know, you'll see the NASDAQ is down about 7%, the S&P 500 down about 5% over this time frame. Um, so those aren't massive drawdowns, you know, by any means, as Adam mentioned, we would expect to see this type of drawdown to happen twice a year on average. Um, but, you know, the, the upshot of pointing out this is, is I want to make the point that it was more of a, of a, of a broad based sell off here, um, you know, from a, from a style standpoint, um, which is, you know, I think, I think as far as, you know, where we're leaning from a size and style standpoint, as I mentioned, we're leaning growth, we're leaning non-large right now. Um, you know, this type of sell-off really does nothing to shake our confidence that that is where we want to be. Now, you know, why did this sell-off occur? Um, you know, I think it's, there's really, I, I've got one answer, you know, the answer usually is we don't really know, stocks just sell off sometimes. Um, but in this case, we had kind of like a point, like a data point that happened with uh, with the CPI report that came out earlier in April, um, and it created a little bit of, of selling pressure. You know, I did want to make a point, though, that it's it feels like the inflation picture is just different right now than it was just a couple of years ago. You know, we flash back to 2022. Inflation was the thing that the market was looking at. Um, this was a snippet from the quarterly letter that we sent out to to all of you in uh, the third quarter of 2022. And we made the point here that, you know, early in the summer, um, inflation was coming in better than expected. And so the stock market was really rallying. But then that momentum turned around on a dime because there was a hotter than expected uh, inflation report that came out in the month of September. And you can see the numbers here are huge. It was a 12.5% rally on the way up, a 17% rally, uh, sorry, 17% uh, fall in value. Uh, once we got the 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 worse than expected inflation numbers and and really this was the thing that was driving the market and if you remember you know inflation was really more at a crisis level you know approaching nine percent you know whereas today we're only at about three and a half percent and I think the implication there is we're seeing the stock market react very differently to the inflation data today than it was back then I know it's you know that's still fresh in our minds about how um, disruptive inflation was for the stock market. Uh, but we can see here is, you know, the CPI released their numbers on, uh, sorry, the, the BLS released their, their, or the Fed, I should say, released their CPI numbers on April 10th. And it was slightly worse than expected. It was about a tenth of a percentage point um, higher than what analysts had expected for inflation. And so it created some selling pressure during the day. But what you'll see here, what you will see here is the blue bar is the S&P 500 which was down less than 1%. So, you know, about 1%, not, not a great day, but certainly something that we would expect to see fairly regularly out of the stock market. But then when you contrast that to the small cap Russell 2000, which is the uh, the gold bar here, and you can see it was a much worse day for small caps. They were down about 2.5%. And I think the upshot here is while inflation is still an important dynamic and the Fed's response to it is still going to be something that investors are going to watch, it still is affecting small cap stocks more than large cap stocks. And I think this is really the main reason why we haven't seen small caps make their previous um, all time highs yet. And I think uh, really the reasons for that are twofold. You know, for one, small cap companies are a lot more likely to carry floating rate debt than large caps. So when you have the Fed raise rates to 5% plus and keep them there, that hurts small caps more than it hurts large caps. So you can see here that nearly 40% of small cap debt is floating rate versus you know, only about 6% for large caps. And so the smaller companies are feeling the pain much more than the larger companies. The larger companies are more insulated from it. But I think the second point to make here is that small caps have debt that's coming due sooner than large caps. If you look at when debt is due to be renewed in small caps versus large caps, it's almost like there's a cliff that's coming between now and 2030. Uh, whereas, you know, the majority of small cap debt will need to be um, reissued, whereas larger companies have more of a, a, a longer runway. In fact, some of them have a pretty big allocation to, to really cheap debt that goes out really far into the future. Um, so larger companies are just more sheltered by the high interest rate environment that we see here. 
versus the small caps. And, you know, what, what's really going to matter for small caps and, and the reason why you're seeing the small caps still react so much to the inflation data is that it's really going to matter for them if rates are at 5% or 4% or 3% or what have you when it's time for them to reissue this debt. And that's going to, you know, impact the future stream of, of earnings, the valuations of the companies, um, therefore. So that's uh, that's something to watch. Um, you know, we don't know what the Fed's going to do. Um, we know that, you know, they've been very committed to making sure that they tamp, tamp down inflation. Um, one point I wanted to make, though, as far as like trying to make, you know, a prediction of what's going to happen, you know, this is a, a research report that Goldman Sachs released in the last week. And in their view, when they look at core PCE, yes, it was a little higher. So core inflation was a little higher than uh, was maybe expected in the first quarter, but it was largely due to a, a few temporary reasons. One being consumer electronics were more expensive than they were. And it was really related to year end things. Healthcare was a little bit more expensive. Financial services were more expensive than expected. And they're expecting all three of those, uh, those pieces to really dissipate for the rest of the year. And another key piece that they'd like to point out is housing is still expected to be disinflationary this year and next. So that's going to be um, something that's working in the Fed's favor when it comes to their fight with inflation. And in what, what Goldman is forecasting is that that core inflation level to be at 2.2% over the next three quarters of this year. So the Fed isn't, or so Goldman isn't super concerned about the higher than expected inflation rates that we saw. And again, you know, 9% is more of a crisis level. 3.5% is just higher than what the Fed would like. Um, so we'll see, you know, what actually shakes out with the data, you know, obviously any prediction could go, it could be right, it could be wrong. Um, but I think it was at least interesting to hear Goldman's perspective here. As we move on here, you know, I want to make one, uh, you know, transition to talking about our stock selection process. Um, so the way that we view the stock market is we essentially see two different types of phases for the, just the general direction of the stock market. We have we have a normal market, which you know will include just your, your normal bull market. I should say we we really see three <laughs> three phases: a normal market where the where the market just kind of going uh, as it goes. We have a you know bear markets or these big market downturns uh, that occur. Um, and just from from our stock selection methodology, our models tend to do pretty well because we lean into things like quality and safety um that would lead to, to stocks doing relatively better in, in market sell-offs and we also have a phase that's the recovery phase after a major sell-off and what we know from tracking our stock selection modeling process is that while our numbers tend to do well in those normal markets and in those bear markets relatively speaking it tends to really underperform during those recovery phases in the market. So here you can see we've got 2007 to 2010. We we build models twice a year, so that's why we, you see A and B there. And you can see that during 07 and 08, you know our our group of stocks that we rate as viable did better than the group of stocks that we rate as sells, and that was pretty consistent. But then once the momentum flipped and the stock market started recovering in 09, we saw the inverse happen, where the group of stocks that our model was leading us away from materially outperformed the group of stocks that our model wanted to buy. And so, you know, it used to be that we would just take this as rub of the green that, you know, we know we want to be in long term holdings. And if there's a little bit of underperformance, um, that's OK. But at some point in the mid 2010s, we decided to, to see if we could do something about this. And so we modeled out, um, we really applied our same modeling technique just to these intervals where the stock market is recovering, where you see really strong performance after a big bear market. And what we learned was that you know, we we produce some of the most highly effective models that we do, some of the most highly effective results when we turn on this recovery model. Um, and so, you know, well, these recovery phases, they tend to last anywhere between 18 and 24 months. Um, you know, we used to think that, you know, once the market gets back to previous all-time highs, that's the end of the recovery phase. That's actually proven to be incorrect. Uh, a recovery phase can actually blast through previous all-time highs. Um, what what matters is is basically you know how risk on is is the market and there's a couple different ways that that you can measure that um, and but I wanted to make the point here the market bottomed out in October of 2022 and has been on a pretty steady recovery since then and what we've seen is um, you know about 18 months it's been about a year and a half since that that market bottom and so we're right about at the timeline we would expect to turn that this recovery model off and so we've come to the determination that it is time to do that and you know i'll, I'll show some data that shows as to why 
Um, you know, real quick, I just want you, there's a lot of lines here. I want you to focus on the orange line. The orange line is showing how our, you know, recovery model buys do against our score buys. And when that line is going up, that means the recovery model is doing better. If it's trending flat, you know, or down that, you know, that means that it's probably about time to turn the recovery mo model off. In 2020, this was highly effective. The group that our recovery model said to buy really, really outperformed the group um, that our standard model, you know, would, would agree to buy. So it was a really good move to turn it on in 2020. This, this go around was a little bit different. You know, while we would normally expect our normal model to underperform, it actually didn't during this most recent time frame. And I think, you know, we've got some theories as to why, one of them being there just wasn't as much panic in the market as we would normally see. Um, but what you can see here from this from this chart is, um, you know, this orange line didn't go consistently up like it did in 2016 and like it did in 2020. It would go up, it would go down, it would go up, it would go down. And that was in response to the stock market that was a little bit more choppy than, than the recoveries have been in the past. But I think the really interesting thing here is that, you know, while that recovery model didn't do, you know, as well as we would historically expect, it worked really well in combination with our standard model. And so the way that we actually implement this is we don't just turn, you know, our quality model off and go to the recovery model. We kind of take the Venn diagram of the two of them and we want to buy stocks that rate well by both models. And that combination here did quite well. Um, and so even though that recovery model, you know, didn't do as well as our standard model did, um, the combination of the two created this huge delta. So the, the, the difference between the buys and the sells for our standard model was 10%, which is very strong effectiveness for us. It was 16% when we combined the two models together. So there was a lot of natural synergy between these two models. Um, you know, I like to say that when we get these big market sell-offs, you kind of have this like perverse excitement about it because you know we believe that that gives us above average uh, stock selection opportunity and while this time was a little different than those those sell-offs in the past it once again proved true so you know i I'll, I'll just say that um you know i just wanted to give that update that we're, we're back to what we consider a more normal market environment right now um but the stock selection opportunity here recently has been quite strong All right, so we're right here, just a couple of minutes over uh, what our allotted time is. Um, and we do have some questions uh, from you. So um, I think we, uh, we have about nine questions that were pre-submitted. So if you have anything that comes in, feel free to scan that QR code um, and let us know. As you can see, uh, you can update, you can upvote some of these questions here if you would like. And you know it'll, it'll bring them to the top, so you can scroll through and see what is being asked. Um, I'll just start from the top here and ask you know the first question to the group, um, and it, it, it's about rebalancing. So, what's your position on rebalancing equity holdings given the current market? Um, you know, Adam, let me let me throw this one to you. You know, how how do we think about you know rebalancing when it comes to uh, one of our you know more holistic asset allocation models? Yeah, there's two ways to think about rebalancing and interpret the question. You know, the first is rebalancing in reaction to something that's happening or that you think might happen in the market. And then there's re rebalancing that just happens uh, systematically through the course of an already agreed upon investment plan. Um, as far as the first potential scenario goes, uh, there's really not any scenarios where we're actively selling out of stocks and buying out of, you know, buy, you know, selling out of stocks and buying some sort of safer asset um, in response to what's happening in the market. Uh, typically that's going to translate to a lot more misses than hits, you know, just look at, you know, the, you know, that long list of five and 10% sell-offs that I've showed that have happened over the last just 15 years and how quickly some of them have bounced back. So, um, you know, rebalancing as a way of going to play defense is definitely not something that we believe in or think that investors should be focusing on. Uh, the other form of rebalancing, which is rebalancing through, you know, uh, strategically as part of an already agreed upon, you know, investment allocation is absolutely what we focus on. And uh, for all of our clients that are not just in a 100% equity portfolio, you've got several different asset classes that you see on your statements, each of those, we have a specific target weighting assigned to them. And um, as the market's moving up and down every day, every week, month, quarter, year, 
the weightings will vary from their respective targets. So for example, if you've got a 60% allocation to equities, the market goes on a really nice run and equities now represent 65 or 70% of your portfolio, we get alerted. We've got the systems in place to say, okay, this specific client is a little more heavily weighted in stocks than we think they should be. And we'll systematically sell out of those stocks and then buy whatever whatever other asset class is underweight as a result. So uh, for us, rebalancing is really a way to keep the portfolio in check through the ups and downs in the markets. We like it because it allows us to essentially sell high and buy low uh, without trying to guess as we move along. And uh, so that's what we prefer. And it's certainly not something we look to do in response to you know, whatever the you know crisis du jour you know, might look like any given day. All right. I think that's a great answer. I have nothing more to add there. Um, so we'll move on to the next question, which is surrounding the cryptocurrency ETFs that are out there. Um, as of right now, and I'll go ahead and take this one, but as of right now, um, the Ethereum spot ETFs have not been approved by the SEC. And I think that there's some uh, concern as to whether or not that's going to actually happen. But as we know, the Bitcoin ETFs are available. Um, you know, so it's never been easier to purchase Bitcoin um, than it is now. So I think it's a, it's a good question. We did touch on this in our last webinar. Um, so I don't think we'll go as deep this time as we did back then. But I think the best way to think about, you know, crypto in general is it's going to be a highly volatile asset class where there's going to be really high highs. There's going to be really low lows. Um, and, you know, I'm not necessarily going to get into, you know, the, the, the X's and O's as far as like what it is and what it does and use cases or any of that, just purely from an investment standpoint, a couple things to think about, you know, you in, in basic finance theory, we think of stocks as being the riskiest asset class, but also the highest expected return asset class. I think you can probably view Bitcoin as being that, but on steroids, um, you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't even know what to say as far as what the expected returns are from Bitcoin, but I think you can expect quite a bit of that, of that volatility. So you just have to be ready for that ride. And I would certainly be careful about ever allocating too much of a portfolio to any of these things that are out there. And the other piece I wanted to make is, um, you have to be careful about taxes. These, these Bitcoin ETFs, they're not able to take advantage of the traditional tax efficiency pieces that ETFs do. Um, so if you know if you buy an ETF as it is right now, typically you're not getting gain capital gains distributions. It's entirely possible to do that to see those with the Bitcoin ETFs because they're not allowed to take advantage of the same you know tax efficiency levers that standard ETFs have. So you know I would say take a look at that and consider that before you make any sort of allocation uh, to any any of your taxable accounts as well. So Andy, let me just add a little bit to that. Um, you know I consider. Um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all of those um, great speculative assets. There's opportunities to play the highs and the lows and to trade it um, and either make or lose fantastic amounts of money, depending on your, your success with that. Um, you know, fundamentally, though, there's a, an argument that says that there's a zero value. Um, it's the ultimate um, expectation for what these things are, are, are going to be worth. That may be wrong. That may be right. But it's certainly... One of the risks that you have to consider um, when you get involved with this. So uh, it, it kind of reminds me of dot com. It's sort of the same scenario. Lots of volatility, fantastic returns, a whole bunch of stocks in this case that had no fundamental value. Uh, eventually, they all became priced accurately at zero. Uh, so you don't want to be the last one holding the bag. Understand this is, uh, you know, a little bit anyway, playing with fire. And so just don't be the last one. Uh, you know, holding out with it. Probably good advice there. Well, I'll throw this next one to you as well. Um, so this is a question that I think has been on a lot of clients' minds here recently. And, you know, with just the idea that rates might be higher for longer, um, are we doing anything different with our core equity strategies and our diversified portfolios? Yeah, and, it, you know, and higher for lower to the point that you made earlier, um, Andy, is still moderate it's not really high rates they're moderate rates now compared to what they uh you know previously were um and it does look like uh there's reasonable expectations that those are going to be um more attractive by you know by the end of the year versus you know what we're looking at right now so uh the environment that we're in right now is an excellent environment for stocks um we're excited about many other asset classes everything basically that is not long bonds um, 
you know, we uh, have some enthusiasm for, uh, but there's nothing going on right now that's that's uh, that's impacting how we're allocating uh, our assets. And and you know, as Adam made uh, the point earlier, we've uh, had a really really fruitful run with the way that we've mixed assets. And and the view is always longer view in terms of like the benefit of of owning various asset classes. Uh, and, and specifically what we focus on is how they balance each, each other out. We don't look at these as standalone assets. It's, it's an asset that mixes in with others. And we're constantly um, you know, on the look for something, uh, some other asset class that will continue to, to provide benefit to a, to a well-mixed portfolio. And for me, it's exciting to be able to do this and not make the huge performance sacrifices in the long run that you do with like a 60-40 allocation. We can get a lot of we can get, you know, maybe not all of the return that equities provide, but we can get towards that and, and provide a much more stable path, um, you know, to, to towards building wealth over time. Adam, maybe, because um, I think there's a question here about our diversified portfolios. Can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the changes that we've made within the fixed income bucket uh, in reaction to some of these rates? Yeah, we've uh, after, you know, 10 plus years of relative quiet and zero rates, you know, the last 18 to 24 months, we've finally been able to take some action at the, you know, when it comes to fixed income allocations uh, and there are short and long-term implications to it. Uh, you know, for us, as rates were going up um, and, you know, as it was becoming more and more obvious that they were going to continue to hike rates aggressively, we felt like the, you know, you know the yield curve and the rates that were being provided on the short end uh, were attractive enough for us as a holding pattern until this height, you know, this uh, tightening cycle was was going to be over. So we felt really comfortable for most of last year, staying really, really short term with our fixed income allocations for clients that had some form of bond exposure in their portfolio. They probably noticed we were holding anywhere from six months to two year treasury like vehicles at most. So this was a uh, certainly a change from what we had done you know, the previous handful of years, which is a little more longer term in nature. And then now uh, what we were really hoping for coming into this year and through this year, next year is to get to more of a holding posture with our uh, bond allocation. So we're a little more comfortable going from shorter term bonds to say intermediate term bonds. So maturities of five years or less versus two years or less. Um, the big reason being, um, uh, reinvestment risk. You know, we know rates are going to be coming down, um, if not at the pace we really wanted them to ha to come down. They will be coming down um, sooner rather than later, and uh, so we want to be able to lock in those currently, you know, more attractive four and five percent yields for a longer runway. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, typically we like to think of fixed income as the more stable piece of the portfolio. 2022 with bonds down 15%. A lot of people started to rethink that. But when we make decisions within a client bond portfolio, we're thinking, how do we how do we position this to really offset major swings in the equity markets? And how do we um, be smart about any kind of risk we're taking? And uh, so we've been comfortable with that. Um, a lot of clients have talked about the, some of the higher yielding money market funds that are out there now and the advertisements for 4 or 5% money market yields. Um, the only thing I'll say is just to be careful on that reinvestment risk front. You know, the second rates are being cut and rates go down, those yields are going to come down hard and fast with it. So uh, it's not a terrible time to start. Uh, it's it's okay being a, a little bit early to the game if you have to be in order to lock in those more attractive rates for a longer window. All right, that's a great point. Um, the next question here is something that I did touch on, um, so I'll be I'll be brief about it. But how likely is inflation to fall or grow? I think some of the reasons why we've seen inflation sort of stagnate here at the you know mid three percent level is there were some year end things that were falling off, and you know we're still expecting to see housing to be disinflationary where it was highly inflationary earlier. But um, Lowell or Adam, did you have anything else that you wanted to add to this point? Uh, the, just the, real, so the the two percent inflation target is really interesting. It's just going to be, uh, it's going to be. Uh, uh, I, I'm curious to see how they handle like the reality of and what the actual inflation rate and where that's going to land versus this two percent target. Um, the two percent inflation target is very new. 
uh, and it was put in place at a time when rates were of an inflation was well below 2%. So this is the first time they're having to navigate down towards that 2% target from a much higher place. And so um, something to watch is how much do they really care about that actual 2% number versus just letting things kind of land somewhere in their historical range of 3-ish percent, but with good economic growth. All right, great. Um, an interesting question here because uh, I know you know Lowell is in the middle of this uh, with our research group, but we're in the middle of rebuilding our stock selection model. So it's a question about you know what we look for when we look at long term growth, like what metrics and data to support those decisions. And well, you might have some thoughts, but um, before before you go, I did ask our director of research, who's uh, you know in our analytical department, um, you know what she has been seeing recently as far as like what are the factors that are correlated with long term stock returns. And shit has been really interesting recently that, um, you know, in value sectors, it's still important to see value metrics, but in more growthy sectors, we're seeing more of a weight towards growth metrics, towards property, profitability metrics, um, and then quality metrics really across the board. And so if we want to get really particular and, you know, if, if whoever asks the question, if you want to follow up after this, we can kind of get into what individual metrics are important, but it's, it's things like earnings growth. It's things like cash flow growth. Um, you know, gross margin for profitability, you know, some of the safety uh, factors are like debt to enterprise value. You know, these these are things that are coming through maybe a little bit more than they have previously. But, you know, Lowell, you've got a long history building these models. You know, is there anything else that you want to add that's important to think about as far as, you know, the long term growth potential of individual stocks? Yeah, so you're you're um, accurate with everything that you said. It varies uh, quite a bit based on the type of company it is in terms of how important growth is. Um, but it, it, you know, one of the reasons why the US stock market has performed so well is we have a big uh, part of, of the growth companies of the world all, you know, in, in, you know, they're ours. And um, it's growth is uh, very important to all of those in, in combination with reasonable profitability. Um, so, and it, I'd say we look at all the, you know, actually we're quants, so we look at everything. Right? one's a candidate factor and then the ones that actually are associated with excess return those are the ones that we key in on and that's really what our uh, uh, stock picking modeling process is all about is is you know considering literally thousands of potential factors associated with return weeding out all the ones that actually have no strong association and then building models typically with about the 40 factors that have that strongest so association um, another way that we look at this is sort of on a, on a more macro level and something that um, we could have mentioned earlier, but this question uh, regarding small cap lagging performance and what to expect ahead. Part of the reason small stocks have lagged is because they've been handily trounced by the larger stocks in terms of earnings growth. And, you know, fundamentally, that's at the end of the day, that's the key driver of of um, equity valuation is, is that amount of, of growth. Um, that is actually expected to uh, flip starting this year where uh, expectations are for small stocks to have substantially stronger earnings growth ahead versus their large cap stocks. And so, you know, as that fundamental pace uh, starts to bear fruit, I think that could be uh, something that is associated with sort of the timing of when we're gonna see a small cap run that, that we've been waiting for, quite frankly, for, for a bit. Thank you. We only have a couple of questions here left. Um, let's see. I want to end on, you know, maybe a different question than this one. So let me let me just bring this one because I'll give it a quick answer. Uh, we had a question specifically talking about gold mining companies. Um, you could be careful. You know, I don't know if this is meant to be a play for gold, the commodity, you know, through buying gold mining companies, but the performance there has been highly, you know, um, irregular. So, you know, we 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 have about we do have twenty four stocks that we evaluate that are considered gold mining companies. None of them we would consider viable. Eight of them we would consider in our most bearish group of stocks. Um, and then, you know, the the range of outcomes over the last six months for these companies are from plus sixty one percent to minus seventy three percent. So, you know, these things don't act, they don't like behave as like one monolith. Um, you can get results that are all over the place. So is it a good time to buy gold mining companies? Maybe sometimes it is. 
Um, you know, I think that if you're looking at, you know, if you're trying to get exposure to commodities, I know gold's had a, had a good run recently. Um, you know, typically we don't see commodities make their way into our, our, our model portfolio just because there's a lot of risk and not a lot of, you know, return. Uh, that you would expect out of this group. So, you know, I think I would be cautious to say uh, if you're looking at it at, at gold mining companies or really any industry uh, in general. Yeah, and so, Andy, let me put a slightly different spin on that because this has been an age old question. I mean, 38 years ago, um, when I heard this question the first time in terms of, of you know, buying gold. Um, and my first boss here, Ted Rosenberg, uh, his response was always, you're better off buying the mining stock than you are buying the commodity. The commodity gold, um, the expected long-term return of gold is basically whatever inflation is. It's an excellent inflation hedge, but on a real return basis, its expected return is zero. So that's hard to get excited. Um, there's diversification benefits periodically with, with, with gold, but, you know, if you hold it for 38 years, your return is going to be disappointing. By contrast, if you hold the gold mining stock, you're going to get some volatility like you get with um, the underlying commodity, uh, but you're going to get a much more attractive total return in the end. So I would definitely suggest buy the buy the, the company or the mining company versus the commodity if you're looking for better long-term performance. All right, we'll move on. Last two questions here. Um... See, Adam, I'll, I'll let you take this one because I think you might be able to answer it pretty quickly. Uh, can IRA money be transferred directly to grandchildren before taxed? Yeah, during your lifetime, no. Uh, you're not allowed to, unlike taxable assets or money in, say, a brokerage account or a bank account, you can't gift IRA money uh, during your lifetime. You can leave it to someone at your death. Um, so the short answer is no, you can't. Uh, we get this question a lot. You can't take money out of an IRA or directly transfer it to kids or grandkids as a way to get around any potential future tax consequences while you're alive. Um, you can, uh, if you're worried about your estate being taxable or any estate tax issues, you can believe in, or name children or grandchildren as beneficiaries on your IA, IRA for the money to be directly transferred to them at your passing and avoid probate. Um, if they're grandchildren and they're minors, there's some other nuances to that. Um, that you want to be really mindful of, but um, really you can only transfer IRA money at death. All right. And the final question here. Um, so Adam, you touched on this as well, but so the apparent correction that we're in, you know, how long do we expect it? How, how severe will it be? Um, I think you answered those questions in your section. I, I did have some other numbers I wanted to share real quick. So if we look at the Russell 3000, which is just, you know, the most broad based, uh, you know, U.S. stock market index out there. Uh, through yesterday's close, stocks are up 6% year to date. Over the last one year, they're up 24%. Since the bottom from a total return basis, uh, up 43%. Um, and the drawdown currently is about 4%. It was about 6% um, on, on Friday. That was its uh, the, the, the max drawdown. So, you know, I'll say to me, this strikes me as just like a run of the mill, you know, healthy pullback that happens in the midst of a broader bear, uh, bull market. Um, you know, so I don't think this would rise to the, the level that would cause us much panic. I think if we look at the stock market's performance so far this week, it's already making back some of those losses that we experienced in, in April. Um, you know, Adam, I think you already did a great job explaining your piece on this. Lowell, do you have any final comments that you'd like to make? Um, I don't, but we have um, a couple of questions um, in addition to these that are uh, that are loaded into the, um, the meeting. So let me let me just um, I'll read those questions and then we can uh, address them. So uh, one was already answered. Another one is uh, maybe a deeper dive into the recovery model. Um, the question is, can you provide an overlay of the recovery model with your other models? What is the true recovery phase or did I miss it? So I can talk a little bit about um, how we model it and then uh, Andy address kind of how we use it in practice. So with the benefit of hindsight, we know exactly where the bottom of every big market line is. And our definition of a market decline is 20% or better. So uh, we can look back and say, all right, this market decline bottomed out on a specific date. And then we model the next six to 12 months after that. And typically what you see is a very vigorous uh, recovery phase that, that follows. And the type of stock that um, does the best in that recovery period typically is the stock that was beaten up the most 
on the way down. And, um, you know, so as Andy mentioned, we kind of consider that our risk on model. And the types of stocks are very different, the characteristics versus the ones that we're um, uh, selecting with our normal model, which is just in normal market phases. Actually, when we model our normal market now, we exclude these recovery phases from our uh a period so that we're not modeling those that's it's a you know it's a separate process um and then the combination of the two that overlapping um company that has attractiveness ac across both our quality model and our risk on model that's the one that we're going to key on uh, and there's about as andy mentioned there's about a year and a half two year period where that type of stock will lead the market and um and it's a little bit of a uh of a you know combination of art and science in terms of when to turn the market the models on when to turn the, the models off we we use that timing mechanism as as part of how we decide when to do that so with the benefit of hindsight it could prove to be the case that we turned the model off too soon uh the first month so far we've been like spot on uh, so, which is just dumb luck if that's uh if that's true uh, but you, we won't know until um you know, time has passed, whether, you know, the timing on this, uh, turning it off, uh, you know, how, how perfect that, that was. We don't need to be perfect. We know that we got the substantial benefit um, from using the model for 18 months. And because recovery score is a double-edged sword, when the market, if the market were to sell off vigorously again, those types of stocks, again, will lead the market down. Um, you know, it's just a good time to sort of take chips off the table and say, all right, we, we did well enough for this period. And then um, question, uh, Adam, for you is is uh, is uh, from one of our very longtime clients and good friend of mine. Uh, uh, what is your investment allocation for moderately aggressive investors? Sure. Yeah. So moderately aggressive investors, it's going to be divvied up across three different buckets. You know, there's an equity piece, there's a fixed income piece, and in most cases, there's an alternatives bucket. Um, and so uh, this is meant to, as a benchmark, this is meant, uh, a moderately aggressive portfolio is kind of meant to mirror your typical 70% equity, 30% fixed income portfolio. Um, and so the equity allocation uh for moderately aggressive, still hovers between 60 and 65% with a smaller 15-ish percent allocation of fixed income and then the remainder in alternatives. So um, it's, uh, you know, again, you think of it, if you think of risk as a spectrum from zero to 10, zero being the most conservative, 10 to being the most aggressive, this would be like a seven or eight out of 10 in terms of the, uh, you know, the magnitude of, of the risk that you're taking. Uh, uh, and so th those are the uh, the buckets and the categories. And we've got a lot of illustrative pieces that show the specific percentage of every little category, uh, which I can share. Uh, but we're actually, uh, our uh, investment committee is meeting tomorrow and discussing potential changes to that. So all the percentages that I just referenced could uh, change within the next 24 hours, not by much, but they might be changing. So Adam, on the on the private side, uh, can you talk just briefly about the, the the general categories that we hit there? Yeah, on the alternative side, there's two main vehicles uh, that we like to access alternatives through. The first being managed futures, and um, it's an expensive sounding term, a fancy sounding term, but managed futures really involves um, a trend following strategy that can trade in stocks, bonds, currencies, and commodities. And it's meant to take advantage or follow specific trends in each of those asset classes by going both long or short in those categories. So um, what we found to really boil it down to its core is those trend following strategies provide a substantial diversification benefit over stocks and bonds over the long run, um, especially in crisis periods where the market really sells off hard and fast for whatever reason. Um, so that's been one of our best diversifiers. And the other is private credit. These are um, loans made to non-public domestic and international companies. So these are private businesses that don't trade on the stock exchange that might have millions and millions in revenue, but just aren't public companies. They need financing for expansion, acquisitions, or just to generally for working capital. 
Um, and so when you invest in a private credit vehicle, you're essentially making loans to those uh, companies. Um, the yield on those loans tends to be high single, low double digits. Uh, and uh, so that's another great example of a diversifier, not highly correlated to public markets. Um, that's done incredibly well, especially over the last 18 months with um, all the uh, the volatility in domestic bonds. All right, saying that uh, addresses the other questions. I think we're we're good to go and right at the one hour mark. All right, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thanks.